El día de hoy tenemos una doctora muy especial que viene directamente desde Australia y vamos a presentarle su más recientes trabajos y vamos a darle la semblanza. Andrea Russell es una cineasta e investigadora interdisciplinaria en arte y ciencia, experta en nanoarte. Tiene manifestaciones artísticas que entrelazan nanociencia y tecnología. Crea películas experimentales e instalaciones de imagen en movimiento que exploran la escala, la mediación tecnológica y la percepción del dominio submolecular. En el proyecto Widely Oscillation Molecules, ella convirtió la instrumentación nanocientífica en herramienta cinematográfica para poder crear experiencias sonoras y táctiles a la inmersiva la nanoscala. Sus obras han sido presentadas en el New York Imagine Science Festival, en el Oaxaca Film Fest en México, en el New Zealand International Film Festival, en el White Night en Australia y en el Sonar Más D en España. Su trabajo ha sido laureado y financiado por el gobierno australiano, el Australian Network for Art and Technology, Council of Humanities and Social Sciences en Australia, el St. Kilda Film Festival y el Oaxaca Film Fest. Andrea recibió en el 2019 el Synapse Residency en donde desarrolló obras que exploraron las implicaciones sociales y culturales de sistemas diagnósticos en colaboración con el Ian Potter Nanobiosensing Facility. En 2020, Andrea realizó una residencia artística con Taller 30 en San Miguel de Allende, el Laboratorio de Arte AC con el Tecnológico de Monterrey y una miembro del programa ANAT de EDA de Australia. En 2021, finalmente, comenzó como investigadora en Symbiotic A, University of Western Australia. Por favor, recibamos con mucho agradecimiento y apoyo a nuestra doctora Andrea Russell. Y la cualquier duda que tengan va a ser enviada por el chat. Si gustan, puede ser en español. Nosotros no hacemos un de la traducción. Eh, micrófonos y cámaras van a ser eh, totalmente apagados. Y al final se va a dar tiempo para que ustedes puedan comentar cualquier cosa. Muchas gracias y empezamos. Hello everyone, thank you so much for coming. Uh, let me just share my screen. Yeah. Great, so thank you so much for the introduction, Adrian, and for inviting me to speak today. I'm really excited to be here with you, even though I'm all the way in Australia, it's seven o'clock in the morning. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about nano art as interdisciplinary practice, and I guess I'm a little bit anti-disciplinary, um, but anyway, we have to use these terms in order to make sense of things. And so what I'm going to talk about is um, a couple of my research projects and my creative practice. Um, I'm going to go through a couple of approaches to science art, and I'm going to do that via showing you guys different nano art projects from other artists as well. Um, I'll talk a little bit about why we do interdisciplinary science art research and, and what the particular value is from the perspectives of science and also um, cultural research. I'm going to talk briefly about uh, collaborations and um, sort of share a little bit of my experience from developing new collaborations and then just briefly run over some programs and opportunities if anyone out there is interested in following down this kind of path. So I kind of use these different terms to describe myself um, for various reasons, um, depending on the funding, depending on uh, the research group to help to contextualize myself. But I'm, I'm sharing them all with you now, um, just so you can see that there are really multiple skill sets that come into interdisciplinary projects. So uh, I sometimes call myself a science artist, a nano artist, a media artist, if I'm making installations for a gallery, a filmmaker, if I'm submitting to a film festival. And, and generally always I call myself a researcher because um, I've always worked in research. So um, a science artist or a nano artist, what this kind of means is that I'm working with nanoscientific data, instrumentation and philosophies and what that means is I do a lot of this sort of thing um, often this is confocal microscopy I'm often doing light microscopy and working with different types of scientific imaging I have also done a lot of this I, I worked as a camera operator um, for some years mostly in documentary and non-fiction before coming back into um, the research space And increasingly, I'm doing this kind of work, which integrates um, scientific data with um, ideas from cinema or 
the cinematic material. Um, this example is a film called Dead Time, which used eye tracking data and looked at um, long shots in slow cinema. So this is a shot from Michelangelo Antonioni's The Passenger, which um, had a seven minute shot in it. Okay, so how did I get here? Uh, I started in science, actually. I studied molecular pathology, uh, but that whole time I was working in film at the same time. And yeah. I, I had these two different threads in cinema and in science for quite a long time. Um, I worked in yeah, science. Just a quick, sorry for interrupting. Yeah, I sure. think we have a, you have a little uh, screen open there, so we can't see your entire ah, screen. Is that better? Uh, yes, perfect. Thank you. I didn't know that one would overlap. All right. Don't worry, There's don't worry, not much on the right hand side anyway, because I was um, thinking there might need to be room for another screen. Let me just resize that a little bit. Yeah, so for a long time I was, um, film was sort of a hobby, I guess. And then I decided to go back and, and study a little bit more formally. And that led to doing a Masters of Art, which um, was in creative practice led research. So uh, I also did my PhD through this mode. And I don't know if this is a very common thing in Mexico, but so I wanted to just describe what it is. Um, so practice led research, and often we're talking about creative practices, is when a researcher includes their creative practice, their creative methods, and creative outputs into the research design. And that means um, the creative work might end up being part of the research output or the major research output. Um, it might mean that you are performing your practice, which you know, most people are fairly experienced with, and then finding problems that uh, exist to be solved through doing the practice. There are a bunch of different approaches to it, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, after we look at some of the works. So I'm assuming many people here are in nanoscience, but just in case there's, um, there are people from other areas, I wanted to define what the nanoscale is, uh, the scale that we're working at. So we're talking about 10 to the minus nine, um, very, very small. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter. And to put it in perspective, we're thinking about the size of viruses. DNA is roughly two nanometers wide, obviously longer, but nanoscience is all many different areas of science, which, is, which are working at that scale. So typically it's described as one to a hundred nanometers. And it might be, you know, medicine, engineering, material science, physics, it might be biology, biomedicine, um, so it really is a whole bunch of different disciplines, but just dictated by the scale that um, we're working at. So I guess I'm, I'm just showing this because you can see on the scale of visible light that there's one to 100 nanometers falls around here. It's below um, the spectrum of visible light. And what that means is we don't really have optical detection systems that can directly image um, things of the nanoscale. And initially when I started working with nanoscientists, I was interested in how we might create moving images and real-time experiences of the nanoscale. Um, how would filmmakers even work when there was no optical technology? And so one of my early projects um, was with the Micro Nano Research Facility, which is in Melbourne, Australia. And hiding behind here is the atomic force microscope that I started to use. And this was the project um, that Adrian mentioned, wildly oscillating molecules. So it was a series of experiments in using the AFM as a cinematographic instrument. And Often what I'm doing is drawing um, techniques or methods from science and putting them into, into media workflows and, and film workflows. And this work here, which will hopefully play, let's see. This was actually just an experiment. Um, it didn't really lead to a resolved outcome, but it was an experiment of taking atomic force microscopy data, which is spatial data, um, so an AFM has a very tiny probe, a few nanometers wide, and it scans across a sample and creates these um, 
three-dimensional spatial points, so X, Y, and Z. So I was interested, what happens if we take that material and put it into media workflows? What can we then do with it? So that's often how I'm thinking. And this work is um, one of the major outputs, one of the resolved artworks, as we say, that came out of this project. And it's actually, it's not a screen-based work. It wasn't designed to be watched on a screen. In fact, the, the resolution probably isn't ideal for this sort of size, but it was designed to be um, in an installation in a gallery. So it was a, a tiny kind of six centimeter screen in the top of a plinth. So that required the viewer to bend over and, and sort of enfold their body over the, the screen. It was also accompanied by um, a 7.1 audio track. So that's seven speakers and one sub bass. So that was really important because, you know, if we think of the atomic force microscope as a mechanism of touch, then we don't normally, the, with the software that scientists use, we don't have that tactility. It's really these kinds of micrographs that you can see on the, on the screen. And um, so I was thinking about how can we use media technology to reintroduce this idea of um, tactility. And so the, the bass, the sub bass speaker, um, for anyone who's gone to, you know, dance parties and raves, you know how you can feel that bass. And that infra bass is uh, sound that's under 20 hertz. So that's actually below the range of human hearing. You might not be able to hear it so well, but you can feel it. So as the viewer walked into the space, they immediately walked into this tactile kind of um, spatial experience. So I'll play this through, obviously, unless you've got a sub bass um, set up at home, which if you do, I'm jealous. Um, you won't hear, you won't feel the sub bass, but you might get a sense of the kind of tactility of the sound. So I'll just play this through. This is, um, I made a four minute loop for the gallery, but I'll just play 30 seconds or so. crescendo and then drops down again and um, part of this work was really trying to give people an idea of the physics of the nanoscale give them a sense like quite literally um, a physical sense of that scale um, okay this next work um, was created at RMIT as well but in a different laboratory with the um, the group that uh, Adrian mentioned, which is the Ian Potter Nano Biosensing Facility. And they have an amazing microscopy facility there. This was the scanning electron microscope that I used for this work. And this was used to create this um, project, the Society of Nano Biosensing. So with this project, I was interested in kind of drawing the technologies that were being created in the lab out and into the public space but also um, trying to create a physical and gestural engagement with the technologies that the scientists were working with. So last year during COVID, I couldn't show the work, but I did get a little grant to make this site. So um, this is the, the website where these two images are hosted currently. And the technology on the left is a thing called copper TCNQ. 
And it's a crystalline material which um, has various applications, but it's sort of like the scientists reverse engineer. They build these crystals or grow these crystals under different conditions. So different temperatures, different amounts of, I think it was methane that they were using um, or methanol. And then they say, okay, what can we use this size of crystal for? So um, I think this particular one was used for, or they were hoping to use it for a cleanup of toxic chemicals in the in industry. And on the right, you've got uh, prostate tumor cells, which are covered in ZIF-8, which is a nanostructure, uh, a nano-engineered material. And that can act as a gene delivery system um, or a drug delivery system. So it's used in this case for cancer therapy. And I know I said we couldn't see nanotechnologies. This, I took advantage of um, the larger size of these ZIF-8 nano particles, um, or sorry, I should say structures, they're not particles, they're much larger than that, and that we can see them in this case. So the sort of novel thing about this, of course, scientists are using SEM, scanning electron microscopy all the time, but the novel thing about this is um, I collected these images, which are about 65,000 by 45,000 pixels um, wide, and what that meant is I can then put the, take them out of the laboratory and create a sort of virtual microscope. The scanning electron microscope is no longer needed. And, and I like this approach because it's sort of thinking about democratizing the tools of science a little bit and bringing them out into um, the public. So what I had was, um, here's the copper CTCNQ, and this is the, the whole image. And what that means is when it's really high resolution is you can zoom in, and even further right down into the individual crystals and retain that really crisp image. So once I'd collected these, I started thinking what kind of media technologies can we integrate this with in order to allow people to, to play with these, um, these samples. And here's the prostate zoomed out halfway in and right up against the cell. And you can see the, um, the particles here, the very white particles. So they're coated in uh, gold. And so they're really, really clear, but they're not, obviously you can't see the structure of them. This is probably about as close as you're gonna get. And they are around 200 nanometers in size. Okay, so what I started doing was playing with gesture responsive technology. So this is the first phase uh, of that work. Um, where we took a leap motion, that's the little sensor you can see there sitting on the plinth. And this um, sensor senses hand gestures. So we just designed some simple, um, a winding motion to zoom in and, and zoom out again. And then people could also swipe and move the image around. And the idea was always to have quite a large scale projection and design it for, um, for big like projection festivals and things like that. And next, um, this phase, the second phase of the movement I did at Taller Treinta last year in Mexico. And this is my collaborator, Diego Liedo. And um, so we started using a Connect, which is a, another sensor you can see there that um, you might be familiar with from different gaming uses. And so the Connect is great because it has a much larger range of motion. So it can sense like full body gestures. And what we started to do was, was play with like using full um, arm movements and bigger sweeps and swipes to control the image. So, so that component is, is finished. At the moment, I'm actually trying to color the scanning electron microscopy um, images for a festival in Australia. And I really hope I can bring this work to Mexico at some point. Um, okay. Let's talk more about uh, approaches to science art. So, so I mentioned already that um, my work, you know, I'm engaging with scientific data, instrumentation and philosophies. And science art projects generally um, normally happen as creative practice-based research or practice-led research collaborations. 
And that's because a lot of the fun toys are within universities and it can be difficult to access them unless you're in a research context, I have found. Um, so there's a lot of us who are working as research fellows or PhD students who are doing these kinds of projects. And they're often dealing with transdisciplinary methodologies. So by that, I mean they're drawing techniques and methods from science and as well from arts, like in the examples that I've shown you. So the kinds of methods that we typically use, well, there isn't really a typical. I mean, I think one thing I'm, I'm jealous of scientists um, of having is there's sort of a set way of doing research in general, I know there are different techniques and things, but in general, it's quite, um, it's established. When you're working in creative practice-based research, you can really pull a methodology together from anywhere. And it takes a lot of work to sort of establish that at the beginning of each project. But the kinds of methods that we might draw in to this methodology are things like connecting ideas from science and art, play, which, I would argue is equally as important in science as it is in art to, to discover and innovate. So allowing yourself time that is maybe non-directed um, to just fiddle around. I always use the term noodle. <laughs> it's a pretty weird verb, but noodling means I'm just taking things and putting them together and just having fun really. And um, creative practice, is or in a research sense it's often about drawing out tacit knowledge and what tacit knowledge is is um, knowledge that's difficult to transfer with text or um, via speaking and describing it to someone else it's it can be watched it can be just demonstrated and performed and you might think of some techniques in the laboratory that are like that you couldn't comprehend until someone actually showed you how to do things. So practice-based um, research can be a really good way of, of making these forms of knowledge explicit. And theory testing is another interesting approach. So you might go into the literature and find an issue in science, which is uh, purely in a theoretical zone, or it might be art theory or media theory. You might find an idea that hasn't actually been worked with in a practical sense. So you might decide to pull it into the creative practice in order to test it. Live experimentation is one that I'm getting more and more interested in. I think that um, especially with work at the nanoscale, you've got these two barriers. Uh, one, where there's the scale, we don't have good sensory interaction with the scale, but two, the barriers of the university and the walls of the laboratory. So using lab experimentation, so maybe you might go into a public space, have a public event where people can engage with the research, um, is one way of sort of breaking down those barriers. Um, and, and from a scientific perspective, that's a really good research outreach approach. Um, from an artistic standpoint, often we talk about interventions. So how you might intervene into science, into a scientific process, how you might do that to make something explicit or um, more, more obvious to the public. And then there's the approach of um, surveying audiences. I don't really do this, but there are quite a few people who do. They'll show a creative work in, a, in an exhibition or a gallery, and then they'll survey the audience to try and understand how they perceive the work. And, and that feeds back into um, future projects. So now I'm gonna show you a series of works. Um, this first one is by uh, Krista Samira and Laurent Mignot, and they're interaction designers actually. So, so one thing I hope you take from this is, is that there are really a lot of different types of art form that interact with science and, and particularly nanoscience. So this work was a tactile interface that you can, well, see and not see in the image. And the idea was the audience could feel an invisible sculpture through the wearing of this magnetic ring. And it was um, a modeled set of 120 reacting atoms that were used to simulate the atomic force microscope's use of touch. So I think it's interesting, like you'll see a few more of these projects engage with the atomic force microscope. I think it's had a particular interest um, for artists because of that, 
that tactility. And so this work simulated um, the atoms interaction rather than being based on, on data. But what they said about this work is that um, their goal was not to show pure data or facts, but to let users intuitively experience aspects of nanotechnology through a haptic user interface and to show how intricate and complex interactions on a nanoscale level could be. This next work is um, from a chap called Joel Ong. He's now in the States, but he did his master's um, here at Symbiotica, where I'm based in Perth. And this work is, is really interesting. It's a mix of wet biological science. So he was in the lab making the, making the work for part of it. Um, it also uses data processing and also site-specific sound installation. And what Joel did for this is cultured or made an artificial eardrum of silk in the laboratory. And then he stretched that eardrum over a very tiny hole and then tapped it with the atomic force microscope, like banging on a drum. And so he recorded the surface vibrations and then put the AFM in a gallery and performed live with the, the kind of sonic influence of the AFM. I'll probably start saying AFM instead of atomic force microscope. It'll It'll cut our time down. <laughs> so this work also, um, one interesting aspect of it is that it shifts the scientific gaze from the visual to the sonic. And, you know, I think in science and lots of other areas, we have this visual hierarchy that that's the most important thing. So, so what Joel's commenting on here is the importance of sound in terms of understanding patterns and interacting with the world as well as just um, vision. So this next work is from Frederick de Wild. Um, it's called Nano Black. And this was the name of the broader project. And so science art projects don't often have shared outcomes, but Nano Black was a collaboration between NASA and Frederick de Wild to attempt to create the blackest substance ever. So they had a shared goal with this project. And eventually they made a substance, which was a, a forest of vertical carbon nanotubes which trapped photons in between and also inside the, um, the nanotubules. And so I'm not sure if they did actually achieve this being the blackest substance ever because there are other products on the market, but um, basically it was interesting. They had the shared goal and then they both used the product for different ends. So NASA used it to calibrate astronomical cameras um, that capture very small amounts of light. I think this was used on Hubble. Um, and Frederick de Wild used it for uh, certain paintings. So one was called 99% Nano Black, Dynamite for the Darkness, and the other one was called Hostage Part One, and that was part of a series. So the next work, and I think this is the last one I'll talk about that um, uses the AFM, but it's really interesting and it's a really key piece of nano artwork um, that comes out of Australia as well. So Paul Thomas is a really interesting, he's a, well, he's just retired actually as professor of art at the University of New South Wales, but he worked um, quite extensively with nano scientists to create, there's three different works, but I'll just um, focus on this one for today. But um, this work he made with an electronic artist called Kevin Raxworthy. And Midas is an installation, it's an interactive installation, and you enter a small dark room, and in the middle is a plinth that has this nine karat gold coated metal cast of a skin cell on it. So when the viewer touches the metal, it completes an electrical circuit, and that triggers, that has two functions. One, it triggers a sonic um, vibrational soundscape which is also created using AFM data. And there's a data projection in the room as well. <clears throat> so another a digital visual presence and the touch starts to disintegrate that image. So as more people come along, the image slowly, slowly disintegrates. Um, and so I guess Thomas is interested in looking at touch and this idea of touch again. And it's also sort of an exploration of touch at the nanoscale, obviously drawing it up to the human scale by creating 
this type of installation, but also an interrogation of the transference of atoms between skin and gold. Because one interesting thing that a lot of artists have talked about is how the boundaries break down at the nanoscale. And that's quite a, quite a poetic thing, you know, when you no longer have this hard barrier of the skin and the atoms and molecules can move sort of freely between the two. This work, My Past, is a sculptural work by John T. Hurwitz, um, who's quite an interesting artist, if you're interested in looking at some of his um, videos online. And this is part of a series of anamorphic sculptures, so made of a female form. And he used a process of photogrammetry, um, which used hundreds of cameras. So if you're familiar with photogrammetry, it's basically if you surround something in cameras and capture all the angles, you can then translate it into a three-dimensional CAD file or computer-aided design file. And so he had, um, yeah, I think it was like about 400 cameras to capture his model. He then took that, that 3D CAD model into the laboratory and used a technique called, um, it's, it's a form of reductive 3D printing. So uh, the one that I'm familiar with is, is the Nanoscribe. That's the, I guess, the brand name. And if you're not familiar with this kind of printing, if you think of additive 3D printing, which we use at the human scale, we're using plastics to build up or to add onto the file. This works in the reverse. So you take a, a liquid polymer and put it on a slide and then that goes into the nanoscribe machine. And there are two lasers that intersect. And where they intersect is um, there's a hardening of the voxel, which is you know, a three-dimensional pixel. So once it's hardened all of the pixels in the file, the rest of the polymer is washed away, reduced, and you're left with these little sculptures that you can, um, you can then use SEM. This is a scanning electron image. Um, yeah, to look at. So this movie is coming more into the moving image space. There aren't a lot of examples of this, of, of moving image people working with nanoscience. Um, but this is a really, I don't know if I've got the sound on this, let me just play and see. Yeah, so this work is a stop motion animation, which was made by IBM not by artists, by scientists, but it's definitely within the creative space um, where I consider it to be. And it was used uh, because the probe of a scanning tunneling microscope can drag individual molecules across a substrate. And these molecules, it says atom, but they're actually carbon monoxide. So uh, a diatomic molecule, very small still, and it's on a copper substrate. So, this again is a feat of what I'm calling endurance microscopy. So scientists worked in shifts for eight days to capture the 242 frames of the two minute video. So they had to continuously keep working. Um, and so IBM weren't addressing specific scientific issues with this work, but they were aiming to create the smallest stop motion movie in the world. And in doing so, they've pioneered the use of this STM to produce moving images. So it's important, it has a lot of um, resonance in the creative space. And this next work is um, a work by Alexandra Kaminska. And she was collaborating with scientists at the Cyber Lab in Vancouver and also artists Christine Davis and Scott Lyle. So, so this project is um, really aiming to create a process rather than aiming to create a work of art. They developed what they call nanomedia using nano optical materials to produce a new kind of substrate. And so they had to work out the processes of all the image making techniques. Um, but the, it was based on the principle that um, of structural color at the nanoscale and the idea that that could be used for the production of images. And you might recognize this kind of image from um, like authentication devices, sometimes on DVDs and things like that. Oh my gosh, do we even help, still have DVDs? If you're old enough to remember that, um, they might have a little authentication sticker on the back. 
and that's the primary use of nano optical images and yeah so this is the last one i'm going to talk about but i but i hope this gives you a sense of like we've seen sculptors we've seen artists who work with visual media um, painters we've seen people working in the moving image i hope this gives you a sense of there are lots of different artistic practices that can engage with um, with nanoscience and technology. So why do we do interdisciplinary science art research? What are the benefits? And, you know, I'm biased because I do it and I love it and I find it really um, invigorating working with people from different fields. But I think, you know, they can we can really tackle problems that can't be solved by a single discipline. So there are some problems that really benefit from having different minds in the room and different perspectives of thinking about things. Um, I've mentioned public engagement already, research outreach can be really beneficial for scientists who work on quite um, abstract things to have ways of bringing the public in and understanding what they're doing. I think this next one's pretty important. I in Australia, we definitely have a loss of pure science. More and more researchers are expected to do work that has commercial outcomes. I've even started to see an increase in the number of PhDs, which are connected to commercial outcomes. And what that means is the, the freedom to do pure science uh, is sort of diminishing. And I think that artists coming back into these spaces can sort of reclaim a little bit of that that play um, that I was talking about. It can act as a critique of science and technology. Artists are very good at thinking about the broader cultural and social implications of technology. And I think this is a really important role of the, the more creative side of um, science artwork. I think collaborating with artists as well can help scientists develop creative thinking and play. And I always think of this example of Andre Geim, who um, you all may know for uh, describing graphene, and he won the Nobel Prize for that. And one thing that he talked about in that Nobel Prize speech was that um, he had his Friday night experiments, he called them. So he would go back to the lab after most people were gone, and he'd just fiddle around and play. And often that meant he'd take a sample that was discarded, and look at it with different technologies. And um, he also said elsewhere that there was, a, there was a paper, there was a publishable paper in every discarded sample. So he was a real believer in spending that time by you know, playing and allowing himself to perhaps use serendipity to discover different, um, different aspects of the things that he was working with. So, um, and I think this set of things is possibly more from the perspective of science of why, why these uh, projects are valuable. It offers different perspectives on science and technology. It can deliver new tools and techniques for science. So the first video that I showed you of mine, um, the one with the, the brown graphene, that work, that technique that I developed that way of using the atomic force microscope was actually picked up by other um, scientists in the lab. And we, we had quite a um, high level publication using that. And so other people started to use the instrument in a different way because of working with me on that project. Um, we can use science art to communicate scientific ideas to the public. Often artists don't like to think of their work as scientific communication, but there's definitely an element of that in any project. I think they can also contribute to the scientific literacy of the public. I like to think when I put something uh, like one of my works in a gallery, there are more people who have interacted with nanoscience. Maybe they don't understand it to a high level, but they're aware of it being there and they, and they may learn something depending on, depending on the work and how detailed it is. And then, um, so following on from that, I think we have the ability to influence the public perception of scientific technologies. And, and that can go in both directions in a positive way and a negative way. So we need to be quite careful about how we, how we speak about these technologies in our work. And I just wanted to put this quote forward because 
you know, I've, this is quite a pragmatic talk. I haven't really gotten to the, the artistic concepts in a very deep way, but I was rereading this, this book by Neil Postman, who's definitely a philosopher of technology. And he wrote this book, Technopoly, I think it was from the nineties, but it still holds up as having some really good thinking about technology in it. And he says that embedded in every tool or technology is an ideological basis a predisposition to construct the world as one thing rather than another, to value one thing over another, to amplify one sense or skill or attitude more loudly than another. And I think that that's, that really gets at what artists can contribute in terms of broader technological development in the world, because we may not design that ideological basis, for example, but it's there anyway. So art can be used to expose those ideologies um, and perhaps suggest better ways of doing things as well. So um, just to finish off, I'll talk a little bit about collaborations. This is just one slide. I, I wanted to give a sense of if you guys are interested in, in doing collaborative science art research, these are kind of the most important things that I think I've, I've taken out of all the different collaborations that I've established. One is to talk about your expectations right at the beginning. So how much time do you want to spend with people? What kind of outcomes? Who gets authored on publication? All of these things that may change, but it's really good to have a conversation about it at the beginning and it helps create a smoother collaboration. Um, communication is really important, obviously, but I think one thing that's good to do at the beginning as well is create a shared vocabulary. So I've had experiences where I've gone into work with really high level professors and they say to me, I don't understand what art is or what design is. And, and so part of that also is defining what your skills and capabilities are. So rather than planning to do X and then realizing three months down the track, you don't have the skills to do it. Um, that can also really include the resources that are available in the scientific facilities or in the artist studio. I think a longer time frame is always better. I've done a few four month projects and, and while they're fantastic for research, it's really great if you can find um, support for a year or, or longer. I think defining also at the beginning whether you have common versus different goals for the project is important. Um, and the last thing is to embed yourself with your collaborators. I think there are a lot of science art residencies now where artists go into laboratories and sometimes the artist will stay in their studio and try and work there. But if you're an artist, go into the lab, be there, sit amongst the scientists, kind of soak up everything you can. And conversely, one thing that I really like to see with these um, residencies in the future is scientists coming into the artist's studio. I think that would be really fantastic. So. I encourage you, if you're interested in these collaborations, ask to go in the studio, ask to learn about their techniques and allow that to sort of influence your thinking because it might be something you can take back into the lab um, and use really productively. So the last thing I want to do is just give you a short list of some programs and opportunities if you are interested in um, doing or contributing to this kind of work. And one is um, the program that Adrian mentioned in my Semblaza, that was the Laboratorio Arte AC residencies. So I went into, well, it was online actually, but um, I had a huge group of students working with me and we had a few different projects and worked together and it was students from photography, from nanoscience, from mechanical engineering. And it was really fantastic. Like I probably haven't worked with such a broad spectrum of disciplines before, and it was a fantastic experience. So um, do look that up. I'm not sure what the dates are, but I really recommend that as a, as a local opportunity. Um, <clears throat> there's also the research group Arte Mas Ciencia at La Unam. Symbiotica here at University of Western Australia um, is open for residency applications. There are STARTS residencies, which is science, technology, and arts. <clears throat> and this is a really amazing program that pairs scientists and technologists and artists together. There's Ars Electronica, which is a big um, electronic art festival 
open to um, scientists and engineers bringing work there too. And then there's Science Gallery, which is an international network. There's one in, for example, Bangalore in India. There's one in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. There's one in Melbourne in Australia. And they have call outs for um, all sorts of things. You don't, you don't need to be an artist to work with them. You could be a scientist who wants to do something like live experimentation. Um, it's really varied. So I recommend if you want to connect with an artist, they also, you can pitch your research and they can pair you with an artist and it's all um, based around their open calls. And then this book's a bit old, but I find it still stands up. A lot of the information here is still relevant. At the back of Information Arts, Stephen Wilson has a list of residencies, postgraduate programs, institutions and galleries and and that can be a really helpful resource as well if you're if you're researching in this area or interested in following it up okay well that's it from me really i just wanted to acknowledge my fantastic um, support and i bring this up as well because i wanted to mention to you the forest research foundation so they are funding my research my fellowship here and I found them incredibly supportive. They also support international postdocs. If anyone's ever looking for a PhD scholarship and wants to come to Perth in Australia, have a look at that one. And they support a lot of science as well. So that could be a good tip. Muchas gracias. And yeah, I look forward to your questions. I'm sorry I talked for a little bit longer than I intended to, but yeah, please question away. I would not worry. Um, cualquier pregunta que tengan la pueden poner a través del chat, ya sea de Facebook o de, o de aquí de la plática, y nosotros se la hacemos llegar a mí. Puede ser si quieren español, no ningún problema. Este, aquí estamos con la traducción. <coughs> Well, first of all, I, I have a, a personal question. You mm -hmm. played for us a recording uh, at the beginning of your presentation. It was like, uh, well, I'm, I imagine the movie, like an action movie, having that sound and that image. Have you ever tried uh, commercializing them all, all along uh, these uh, industrial uh, movie makers? No, I haven't. No, I haven't. I don't, um, yeah, I think maybe that would work. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a composer. That's the other thing. I, I think it would be hard to sell myself as a composer in that space, in the, in the commercial film world. But if anyone's interested in it, they're welcome to approach me. <laughs> Okay, right. Well, here we have uh, the first question. Uh, it says, only for curiosity, I saw that your projects were realized mainly using AFM, SEM, or employing, employing 3D printers. I mean, in instruments that uh, afford an image. Have you created some work using Spectra, for example, from instruments like NMR, DLS, or FTIR? Is it too difficult to do it? I am not familiar with DLS or FTIR. What what is what are those? Definitely not NMR. But I'm not sure what the other two are. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. Is that like um, what's used in X-ray crystallography? Because I have, <clears throat> ah, right, okay. Yeah, thank you. So dynamic light scattering and Fourier transform form infrared spectroscopy. I haven't come across those instruments. I haven't worked with them. But basically anything can be worked with. I, I think there's always a way to integrate scientific data into media workflows in some way it just means you've just got to sit down and do it so average sizes by light scattering yeah here we have another question 
thanks for your questions. Uh, yeah, it's from you. Vale Gomez. It says, hello, I was wondering if you know something about music or music production related to nanotechnology. Thank you so much for your time. So the artist that I spoke about, um, Joel Ong, he might be a good person to look up his work because he has a musical um, background. And so he's probably, he's been quite elusive. I've been trying to chat with him, but he's probably doing some stuff with sound right now and he's in the States. So he might be a good person to look up. Um, other people with music, there's another artist, Andrew Palling. So he's quite interesting. He has a project called Dark Side of the Cell which I sort of, I didn't have time to add more. There were so many other artists, but um, <clears throat> yeah, Andrew Pelling, I would suggest looking up as well. He's probably the key person. There aren't, to be honest, there aren't, there's probably another three or four artists who I'm aware of who work with nanoscience. It doesn't seem to be the most popular type of science for artists to work with. So there's not a lot of us, but yeah, I would say Andrew Pelling and, and Joel Ong. Thank you for the question, Vale. Thank you, that's fantastic. Maybe you can you write the names of the persons you mentioned in the chat so we can like, yeah. make some research. Uh, the next question is from Carlos and he asked, how do you imagine the process to create a piece? He was doubtful about how to elaborate the question, I think. That's a really good question because I, I don't. That's the, everything that I do comes out of playing so I go into the lab, I like, for example, the other day I was, um, I borrowed a magnetic instrument from the scientists. It's like a transfection instrument, basically just a whole lot of magnets that move back and forth. And I was playing with that and some magnetic nanoparticles. And then I started thinking, because I had a 96 well plate, I started thinking about that as a pixel array. And so now I'm starting to try to consider how that how simple images might be translated into this magnetic setup. So I wouldn't have sat down and just imagined that idea. It's, it's really, that's the key of creative practice-based research for me. It's always something that comes out of um, what I'm doing rather than what I'm thinking. And so, you know, creative practice-based researchers are often doers rather than thinkers. I don't know if you guys think about this with your teachers and your mentors and yourselves like I think we obviously we all do a bit of both especially in the science because you sciences because you can think of science as a practice-based piece of research right you're doing practical things as well but I think yeah sometimes I really identify I'm like that person's a thinker and th those are the people that end up going into theoretical areas right and then there are others of us who we need our bodies to be moving we like to walk while we think it helps the ideas kind of flow and so I think yeah I never I never sit down I, I do try to sometimes to sit down and imagine and think about what I'm going to do but I always find it's less productive than just going into the lab or going into my studio and just starting to do so yeah but thank you that's a good question an amazing answer yeah uh, we have another question from Rafael Padilla. What was the call to action that brought you to get into science? Or what was the initial thought? <laughs> it's really dorky, actually. I remember when I was a teenager and I read this book um, by Michael Crichton, and it was about Ebola. I actually loved virology. I was really interested in virology, but I lived in a city and they didn't have a virology major. So I did molecular pathology. So that was what really interested me initially. And then, yeah, things changed though, obviously. <laughs> well, we have here another question. It, it's also from Yamir. It says, uh, what would uh, your other what would your advice uh, be, I think, if we want to explore art from a science student point of view, for example, in our chem chemistry lab class? Mm. Interesting. I mean, would you consider going and finding an artist 
to bring into that space to learn skills from them? Or um, do, I'm, I'm wondering, Yamir, if you have any artistic practices, any hobbies that you already have? And perhaps if so, you could try experimenting with bringing some of those ideas into, into the chemistry laboratory. I think that also, there's, so there's an interesting example from, I forget his name, but the scientist who designed this process of DNA origami, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but it's basically the idea of folding DNA into different functional forms. And so he actually, origami was his hobby, his creative outlet, and he was really into it. And then one day he thought, well, what if we do this with D DNA? And so, I like that example as well, because I think just putting, having hobbies, I mean, maybe they're not as small as hobbies, but having other things that you do with your brain really increases the possibility that you're going to be able to overlap these kinds of um, ideas or techniques in your scientific work. So I really encourage people. I know that everyone's super busy and yeah, I think it's really valuable to have them on your own. I hope that's helpful, Yamir. Good, thanks. Uh, here there is another question from Mitchell. It says, as a woman in STEAM, have you faced challenges or gender issues? What could you recommend to girls and women who are interested in these areas? Hmm, that's a really good question. I think there are, so I've largely worked in biology, which has less, um, like pretty, even gender equity, biomedical science actually often has more women working in it. Um, the only issues, I mean, I haven't faced any issues myself on a personal level, but I have seen certain issues. Um, I was working in a laboratory at the University of Melbourne quite a few years ago, and the head of our laboratory was like really leading her field. And she would say that sometimes, you know, you put a paper forward for peer review, for double blind peer review. And, but <laughs> people know who you are. Like when your work is really specific, people know who you are. And so she would find that her papers wouldn't get accepted. Like she felt there was a real boys club because most of the leading, other leading scientists were men. And so she, in, in the publication space, she often felt locked out a little bit because they were all editing these, the big key journals and things. So, I mean, you do hear stories like that. Um, but what I'd recommend to girls and women who are interested in these areas is support each other. I'm not sure if you have anything in Monterey like this, but um, in most of the maiden cities in Australia, we have like groups for females in STEM, females in engineering. There's a specific one for engineering. Um, and I think just going along to those and supporting each other and just being being supportive of each other in the workplace as well. Um, I think sometimes, you know, and I'm speaking more generally than just in STEM, I think sometimes I've had female um, authority figures in my academic life who have been much tougher on me than, than the males have. And so, which is interesting. I think that some women feel maybe threatened by young women, like there's not enough space for for more women but there is and so I think just support each other be friendly help each other out when you can um, and hopefully you know we just create a culture of support and and also the other piece of advice I would have is find a mentor someone older someone more experienced in the area that you're in I know we have official mentors when we have people supervising our research but I certainly have had some other people who might not be in the exact area that I'm in, but other people who have really helped me with funding applications, giving me advice, like all sorts of support. So I think seek those people out. It doesn't have to just be the one person. I mean, this is, this goes for men and women, this piece of advice. It's um, yeah. But I think also if you're, if you're a woman and perhaps having a woman in that mentoring space might be helpful because you can understand what the what the challenges have been for her um, as they move up in their career. Wow, what a great advice. Um, the next question is from Valeria Orozco and she's wondering if you think there's a possibility to create a gallery 
where the seven fine arts created with nanotechnology are involved. How could, do you imagine it in case of being possible? Fantastic question. I love it. <laughs> My mind is, um, yeah. Gosh, where do we get the funding for this? Do you think we could build this at tech? Let's put that on the wish list. I think it's, um, yeah, amazing. I mean, obviously we'd want a screening space. We'd want some really big spaces for um, public engagement as well. I think we could have something which is um, more traditional for, for painting. We could have a venue for live music. Um, yeah. All the things. It's interesting. That's a really interesting question. I'm going to think more on that. It's, it's interesting to think about how do you have some sort of cohesion architecturally when you're trying to serve the seven fine arts all in one place? That's a really good question. Thank you, Valeria. If you have any ideas about it too, send them through. We can try and make it happen. Maybe that's on the 10 year, <laughs> the 10 year to-do list. Amazing, definitely. Yeah. Uh, the next is part of a congratulation message for you and it's divided, I think it's another question. Let me check. Okay. Uh, yeah, what is your opinion on this project? Oh my God, I need to read the project. <laughs> okay, I'm going to read it all. Thank you very much for this talk. I really enjoy learning and thinking about the different intersections happening around art and other disciplines. I believe that another place in which science and art um, intersect is a tendency towards utilizing any eh, highly academic or non-accessible language, which makes these researchers and artworks somewhat unapproachable for a general audience. What is your opinion on this subject? What can be done to make this difficult to describe works more open? Yeah, this is a very, very good point. And it's something that I think science artists spend a lot of time thinking about. Like how much do you, how much do you tell the viewer? How much information do you give them? And then how do you give them that information? So, so personally, like when I go into a gallery, if there's too much text to explain something, I sort of get turned off, but at the same time, I'm working in quite abstract spaces. So the first work I showed you, um, I did have a reasonably detailed sort of description of the exhibition and how things were created, because I think you do need a certain level of intellectual access into understanding what you're looking at. Um, and, and yeah, as you say, to do that without using really academic or inaccessible language is, is quite hard. Like how do you even, in a few words, how do you even describe what the nanoscale is? Most people have no idea. Like when I say nanoscale, and even in a professional context, if I'm networking with people, they just turn off because they don't know what it is. It's fascinating, but you've got to be really good at, at shortcutting what these things are. I don't think I have a really um, succinct answer to that, except to say that um, there are festivals and galleries who use certain techniques and one of them, so the projection work that I'm developing for um, this projection festival next year, um, it's called Illuminate Adelaide, the, the festival. So our plan is to show that work with the prostate cells and the Zephate. And there will be um, an associated, like my, one of my scientific collaborators is gonna come and then I'm gonna come and we're gonna talk about the work. So there will be a chance for the public to ask questions. Um, we can describe a little bit more what the actual technology is. And, and then the science gallery that I mentioned, so their technique is each work has like complex works. They have a moderator. So there'll be someone, so young people normally between 15 and 25, they train as moderators and they learn everything about that work and they're right there next to the work to discuss it with the public. And I think that's really nice. Like I, I really do like that approach. Um, the idea of developing conversation around it. Like I think that's really nice rather than just having a descriptive text or, or something like that. Yeah, this is a constant, constantly evolving thing. And I think 
there's probably a lot more written in museum studies about this than there are in like art theory. But yeah, I know from all my friends and colleagues who work in science art, we're always worrying and trying to think about this problem. Thanks, Pablo. Well, we have here one last question. It's from Axel. It says, what do you think the impact of your work would be in common art students? Do you think there could be a partnership or there is between scientists and artists? Yeah, I think, I think it's interesting. I, I guess by common art students, you mean more traditional, traditional art students. Um, I think that, you know, science artists are a particular type of artist. And I think sometimes I think there's a spectrum with science at one end and art on the other end and science artists are somewhere here. Like, I think there's a lot of artists who say that's not art or, you know, that's engineering or it's actually a different field. But, you know, this is where my anti-disciplinary sort of thinking comes in. I'm like, it doesn't matter. Like we're, we're all doing things which, which question the world, you know, like if you're thinking about a theoretical physicist who's looking at dark matter, then they're interested in the nature of the world. An artist comes along and they're, they're using different techniques and they're having different outcomes, but they're, they're also interested in that, in that space. So, yeah, I think, I think sometimes um, more traditional arts are really not interested in science art, but then there are so many people who are, so many artists who are of different types. Um, and I think, yeah, definitely, definitely there are people who paint and um, are sculptors and then engage with science. So, so yeah, I think there can always be a partnership. I think what you, what you need to look for is a productive relationship. Like if you meet an artist and you're really good at like inspiring each other and riffing off different ideas and you have good conversations, like that's the indicator, that's the person you should be working with. I think rather than saying, oh, I want to work with that person and they have said yes, if you, if you can't have that productive shared passion and interest, then it is a more difficult collaboration. I hope that's helpful, Axel. Yeah, I think it was. And the last thing of, well, for us to do is to share you this reconocimiento for you. You'll be delivered to email <laughs> all through the day. And people are asking for your social media, so maybe you can help them like, write on the chat. So sure. thank you very much, Andrea. It was amazing, and we hope to see you here more often. Like, I really mean, and I really enjoy the time we spent together, and I hope we can have another time. So I would thank love you very to much. come back and, and work there. I'll just write my my website as soon as before you close it down, so people can yeah. hellosynesthesia.com. And there's the Society of Nano Biosensing at dot online. If you want to have a play with those big images, it's not perfect, but it's um, just a good sense of what it is. Those are the two main ones. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much for the certificate. I love it. I'll put it on my wall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And, and also, night. por favor. Oh, sorry, continue. No, no, go ahead. That was just to, uh, a quick reminder. Eh, por favor, llenen la encuesta que está en el chat que les pasamos al principio. Ahorita las vamos a mandar y eso ya todo por mi parte. Por favor, continúe, Andrea. Please continue. Great. Okay. It was uh, just a reminder for them to fill the survey. Yeah. Okay. So, bye. Thank you. Oh, bye, everyone. Thank you.